Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. Is that Mort Kondracki whose picture you're show uh, you're showing me? I'm glad you recognized it because it's not a very good picture, but it's the one I found. Uh, yes, right. it's Mort. It's Mort Kondracki. I know Mort pretty well. I had an office Our, next to his for years. Right. He was he was at the New Republic, and he was a very good reporter. Uh, and there's something he did that's very difficult. I didn't realize it was difficult, but uh, you know the concept of the conventional wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is everybody says, you know, this is what it, what 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 uh, all of Washington says. At least it what used to be an important concept. Um, and I realized when I went to Newsweek, and I, my job was to come up with the conventional wisdom, that it's not easy. It, it's hard to do. Uh, didn't you, you, didn't of, you even start a conventional wisdom watch? I did. Newsweek? I yes. did. Mm -hmm. Me and John Alter, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, you know, it, it, you're, you're out there alone. You have yesterday's conventional wisdom, but what is it going to be today? What is the, you know, is, is the thinking that Carter is, Carter is making too much of the energy crisis or too little, or, mm -hmm. you know, Trump should shut up or no, he, Trump's campaign is too Pacific. He should, you know, get on the stump or something. I mean, you don't quite know. And it's hard, it's hard to divine. And Mort was very good at that. He was, he was sort of the. At knowing what tomorrow's at, conventional at, wisdom at, would at be, come at creating the conventional wisdom. Oh, okay? I see. Uh, he sort of, he, he, you know, and it, it helps if you're a, a, a sort of middle of the road thinker, or a, a sort of eclectic Catholic person. As I mean, Mord is this was. like kind of a backhanded compliment? I can't tell whether you're really complimenting. Well, him. it's both. It is uh -huh. what it is. It is what it is. It's uh, the the people the people who tend to come up with tended to come up with the conventional wisdom like. Mort and Howard Feynman are people I respect. Okay, uh -huh. uh, I guess Norm Ornstein used to be Mister Conventional Wisdom, but uh, then he veered off to the left, so he's not that anymore. Anyway, this is all about artificial intelligence, Bob. Ah, uh, uh, because it's all falling into place because because you wrote an article mm -hmm. uh, in your newsletter, mm -hmm. basically pointing out that because artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, the, the, at least Chat GTP three, the the, um, the 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 kind of language model that they use for that, yeah, the large it, it, learning it, yeah. model or whatever. It ingests large basically every it, it ingests basically everything written. So it everything that's written, so it just reflects what's written. It reflects uh, the it's, the conventional wisdom right. that is embodied in those texts. And my question is, well, that's sort of bad as that's sort of bad you know, in itself, but also, is it capable of doing what Mort Kondracki did, which is come up with new conventional wisdom, or is it just going to plot along in the same old rut that the existing written material that it's ingested embodies? Uh, no, I think as it stands, it, ca it cannot, uh, it cannot, prognos it can't prognosticate, first of all, and tell us what tomorrow's conventional wisdom is going to be, and it also can't lead the pack. It can't be the trendsetter. Right. I mean, it's right. just not going to say anything new. I mean, that was the point I was making is it's always just going to reflect uh, conventional biases. And, and that's why they take active measures to kind of strip it of some biases, uh, the more offensive biases. You know, they have, in effect, focus groups, I think, that give it feedback and say, I didn't like that answer. And then uh, somehow that kind of answer by virtue that, of that feedback becomes less likely that, in the future. That just, that just reinforces the conventional yeah. wisdom. No, it's totally, think, uh, it's a conventional wisdom you... machine. That was a, that was part of the point of the piece. Right. The other part well, was we need something, we need something more like, uh, and, and by virtue of that, it reflects, you know, the, the political biases and so on of, of, of the people. Uh, so, you know, if you ask it, you know, if you say name a country that violated international law and it's trained on American text, it's probably gonna, more likely to say Russia and invading Ukraine than the U.S. and invading Iraq. I would guess. I don't know. But 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 that was the 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 subject I kind of dwelt on and said that in that kind of realm, if you want machines that can actually do a better job of like adjudicating border disputes, uh uh, pointing out when international law is violated than we have done. You want something more like Mr. Spock. You want, you want, you know, a real like intel alien intelligence that doesn't reflect 
the human biases, where this this machine, by definition, starts out reflecting them and only doesn't reflect them to the extent that these focus groups strip out particular biases that happen to come to the attention of the focus groups. But you're always going to be dependent on the humans for right. the frame of mind. Right. It's sort of like conventional wisdom plus Yelp, which <laughs> yields more yields more <laughs> conventional wisdom. It raises a whole lot of issues. Is the is is what it throws back at people basically the same thing as what people on the right call the narrative? I think by the, yeah. by the narrative, people mean the conventional wisdom. The other issue is: is there a conventional wisdom anymore? Since we're now so polarized that actually there are no more more Kondraki figures. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's either either you have the left conventional wisdom or the right conventional wisdom. We actually need more people creating conventional wisdom in the center. Um, uh, and, and so if it reflects the narrative, that would mean it reflects the left conventional wisdom or the left liberal or the. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the other place you can intervene with this, aside from like after it starts generating shit, kind of fine tuning it with the focus groups, as I'm calling them. Uh, is in your selection of the original texts. So it's kind of like the, the problem faced by someone running Twitter or Facebook. It's like, who are you going to let on the platform in the first place? Uh, so, you know, if, if you if you did it the old fashioned way, if you had really stern gatekeepers like the like the TV networks were, which really, you know, the margins left and right, were not going to get anywhere near those pedestals. Uh, if you if you kind of select your text that selectively that it's trained on, you'll get something more like you want. Maybe that's uh, maybe maybe we should produce a Walter Cronkite machine. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm I'm not sure that Walter Cronkite machine was that good either, but but it is something that's missing. Uh, the the it, the other the other thing it, it seems to raise to me is reflected in this picture, Bob. Which I'm sure you will recognize. That is uh, Naomi. Um, you now I get the two Naomi's. I mean, I know which one she is, but you know what I mean. Fine wolf. and wolf. Uh, wolf. And that's this wolf. Is, yes. This is wolf. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and 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 the one the one article which sort of uh, touched on this uh, is said that it, AI can't come up with the right answer. But it can generate suggestive, crazy answers, um, and, or answers that seem crazy. And I remember back when Al Gore hired Naomi Wolf to advise him on his campaign, and everybody said how wacky and awful this was, and she told him to dress in earth tones. And I had a conversation with her, and she was so from a different planet than I was on. Many, I thought, pe many people are Mickey, but I know. <laughs> but, but maybe but she, she was, more than most. She was from a different, completely unconventional planet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Have you heard her lately? Have you heard her lately? No, she, uh, I, I haven't. She, but she's, I, she's moved. Uh, that's to what a I hear. Solar system. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I hear. But um, uh, the point is, I thought this was actually good for Al Gore because she was so from left field or some different field that. It forces you to rethink your suppositions from the ground up. Say, wait, why do I think this is wrong? Okay, it's because mm -hmm. I believe in this, or maybe it's not wrong. It, it like for, it was like it was like you you know you tear it down before you can build it up, uh, and maybe uh, AI is good for that. It can't generate the conventional wisdom, but it can force you to rethink. Can't generate new conventional wisdom, but it can force you to rethink why you hold the old conventional wisdom because. Mm -hmm. It could come up with like wacky answers. It does like, do wacky stuff. I mean, like somebody I just saw online was pointing out that, like, if you ask it a question like, what's the most cited uh, <laughs> text? Something straightforward, you know, to come up with some, some kind of, some, a certain kind of famous academic paper. It'll just make up a paper that doesn't even exist. And I think, <laughs> I think that gets back to the fact that what it's really doing, you know, there's, there's no understanding in there as I understand it. And I really do want to find somebody who can explain this stuff and get them on, on the podcast. But uh, it, it basically looks for statistical patterns among words that, that that's kind of it. It's, and it does that. It looks for all kinds of arcane structural patterns in the frequency of 
words, but I think it's like, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if, if you ask it, where is the nearest diner? It says the nearest diner, since that's the way the answer to those questions always start. And then it says is, and then, and then it's just like looking for, it's looking for which word is most likely to follow after that. And, the, and, and I guess that's why, uh, you know, with an academic paper, you can say, well, it's most likely to say David. You know, the author is David. And then what's the most like, you know, and so on. And the title, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know. I'm sure I'm, I'm giving you a very crude uh, rendering because I genuinely don't understand it. But but it it, it is uh, it is a strange thing. Maybe it was programmed by George Santos before he won the Olympics. It could be that, uh, you know, the um, I mean, it's interesting. You know, Microsoft has, uh, you know, now now bet big time. And I, I was thinking about this. A couple of things is like if Microsoft's going to make money on this, it's going to have to do it just by. Uh, making it a platform that people pay it to use. You know, make various people want to use the engine, pay it to use the engine. Because Microsoft, when it comes to actually taking something and making it customer friendly, is the worst company in the history of Western civilization. They just can't. They just cannot. They just don't give a shit about the, what the customers actually want. I mean, if you, well, no, you're on Mac. I mean, Windows 11, in every respect that it's different from Windows 10, it's just more annoying. And and that's because they're trying to push all this shit on you that you'll buy. But I digress. We have important things to talk about. We, but can the, talk, well, we should talk about AI more in the parrot room. But okay, well, AI AI thought that I had uh, I had written several books and wrote for the New Yorker. That's the answer it gave. Yeah. For what did you me. say? Who what has who is Mickey Kaus or something? Yeah. Or what? yeah. Yes. And and you thought it's because it had confused me with you. Well, I was joking, but. Oh, I thought you thought it was serious. Okay. No, I no, I mean that uh, that that would be accurate in my case, but um, uh, but I'll I'll take I, credit for the moral animal. I mean, you know, it's not impossible given what I just said about the thing, and given how uh, I guess lately our, our names get intermingled uh, on those relatively few occasions that our names show up anywhere at all. I guess you know they sometimes show up near each other. <laughs> Who knows? Um, okay, well, um, that was a small example of its unreliability. Um, the, I, I, I think in general, I just think after reading your article, a lot less of chat GPT-3 than I did before. I mean, yeah. People are saying that it's not going to be as useful as they feel. Like some people are saying if Microsoft thinks this is going to be a great search interface for Bing, like they're wrong. Uh, right. you know, you want accurate results for certain. Right. If something's if, well, if somebody's going to tell you what the answer is, you want the answer to be accurate. Right. You know? And um, okay, we can talk about it. We can talk about are there other kinds of AI and whether Google is now going to unleash some super AI that's going to well, blow. Well, Google. That's the other thing is like, there's been a kind of a the 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 Facebook's or Meta's head AI guy. There's actually an item about this in today's uh, non-zero newsletter, the Earthling. Um, was kind of dissing uh, Chat GPT and saying, "Look, this isn't. I mean, a number of companies have this. I mean, the T in GPT stands for Transformer, and that was invented by Google. That part of of the language generation technology, right. and uh, and the, the what OpenAI was was just the first one, first company to a put a real user friendly interface on it. That's the difference between Chat GPT and GPT three, which right. is also open AI. And B, you know, kind of have the courage to take it public. Right. Because because a lot of weird shit can happen with this. And 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 it takes a certain amount of nerve to say, okay, go ahead and play with it. And 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 they've done that. But the technology itself, Google's been working on this stuff for a long time. They have some kind of variant of it. They just they just for whatever reason are keeping it behind closed doors. Right, but you don't want a variant. You want something completely different. I want I want Mr. Spock. I want him to say, "This is the country that violated international law." Right. And, and, and here's how many violations there were this year, and these were the countries who did it. And 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 are there Mr. Spock systems that out there that are completely different than this language model? I'm not aware of one. It's hard to even imagine one that would be completely independent of human-provided information because it's going to have to start by drawing on, like, 
media accounts of what happens, right? It's just that what I would want is something where uh, the likelihood of it asserting something doesn't depend on the number of people who have said it. Right. Right now, just it, it kind of follows the crowd, as I understand right. it. Right. Right. Um, okay. Um, well, we, we have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, the, I, I had thought this was going to be the week when we ran out of things that listening to li no. listening to uh, to NPR. They were really scraping the bottom of the barrel for topics. But um, uh, Trump's, Trump's coming back to Facebook, for example, if you want to if you want to segue it, from tech to politics, he's being is that exciting. I don't find uh, that exciting. No, I think what's more interesting is he's not back on Twitter yet. Right. Although he's now allowed. I mean, he he's. I don't that think he's, I, I, he's allowed, but he hasn't done it. Yeah. It's a voluntary decision on his part, in part, I guess, because it was competing with his own pathetic network. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a matter of time. The, there were a series of polls that seemed, three polls that seemed to show him increasing his lead on DeSantis and people, people, really? who, yeah, people who would, um, who had said, well, you know, don't count Trump out. You're crazy to, 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 to crown DeSantis. We're sort of crowing about these three polls. Uh, they they didn't show him trouncing DeSantis. They showed him like, you know, 48 to 34, uh, which if you're if you're a front runner like Trump is historically not a good place to be at this stage in the contest. It's basically where Lyndon Johnson was at the time he dropped out of the race. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. Um, it, it, it's not that good. Plus, there was a a, a, a poll of polls by Charles Franklin, who is, uh, I guess, a Michigan pollster, very respected, uh, that showed that Trump was basically bubbling along at the same level of favorability, but DeSantis was steadily rising in favorability and declining in unfavorability, and more people were knowing about him. So those two aren't incompatible. It could be that People think more and more better and better of DeSantis, but they're just in the head to head against Trump. I guess th this was a good, good period for Trump. I think it was a good period because he shut up because nobody knew, you know, right. uh, you know, he's out of out of sight, out of mind. And so he's looking better while Biden's in trouble because uh, of this document craziness. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, I that's that's how I interpret it. I don't interpret it as. Trump is going to now at the favorite because he's actually there was a poll of New Hampshire. He's way behind in New Hampshire. Uh, DeSantis is beating him soundly in the early primary states, which historically is how you kill a front runner. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's so my line. So you're still predicting Trump won't be the nominee. Correct. Um, are, are, they, there, are there people who haven't been discussed? I mean, uh, how's that Nikki Haley looking? How's uh, Tony Blinken? Tony what? Blinken, Douglas Murray wrote a piece where he mentioned Tony Blinken as a potential presidential candidate. I never heard that. It's kind of not crazy when you think about it. Uh, I, it's I, I don't I don't think it makes a lot of sense. You know, he's not a very to my mind, he's not a super uh, impressive speaker. Uh, he's He's got a little of that weird Mike Pompeo kind of fidgetiness, kind of a, a little. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of a little. A little bit of uh, insecurity about the presentation. I seen it. Or I seen it on him. I haven't seen it on Papeo. Papeo. I, I, I spent as little time watching Papeo as possible. Well, he's back in the news because he's got that yeah. that uh, book that there, he was the lead blurber yeah. of. Yeah. <laughs> there was anyway. Blinken is the sort of guy who would. He's sort of like the the Martin Sheen. He 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 would never be elected. Mm -hmm. He would never be elected. He has for one thing. What does he think of domestic policy? I mean, he's a foreign policy guy. The, the the and but well, he he's might a smart be, guy. He can he, think up the shit to say he, about domestic. He might he actually, talk a good game. Okay, he might actually that. be a pretty good president if he was somehow thrust into office. Uh, which leads me to the 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 incredible, incredibly terrifying thing about Trump are the three women who are competing to be his vice president. Uh, you your, will never guess who they are. Marjorie Taylor Greene. What? That's one. Uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is on this big respectability kick where she endorsed McCarthy and she's playing ball and she's a team mm -hmm. player. It's all because she wants to be vice president. Well, Nikki Haley would love it, but she would he wouldn't have her at this point, right? She's the, at, the, at, 
at this point, well, I don't know. You know, you never know. They, 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 yeah, I thought John Kerry hated John Edwards so much that he would never choose him as vice president. Yet he did. Uh, Trump will. Well, and look at Biden's vice president, you know, somebody who uh, on right. the debate stage kind of like uh, took a stiletto to his face. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, 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 Haley's still in the running, but he, she's not one of the three I'm thinking of. Uh, uh, you're gonna have to help me out here. Not what's uh, not not lo, not Bober, not Bober. No, no. Um, Bo uh, Bobert has continued to be irresponsible while Mark I'm gonna go out Cheney. on a limb and rule out Liz Cheney. Am I right about that, Mickey? Yeah, you're right about that. It's not Liz uh, Cheney. So tell me, yeah, who well, is it? Carrie Lake. Oh yeah. Uh, what else has she got to do? In the, well, yeah, I mean, well, she could be running for Senate. I mean, she could be doing a lot of things. Uh, she's blowing her entire career. Her only hope now is that Trump so values her, her, you know, refusing to concede defeat in her election that, uh, and she sucks up to him that, uh, that he chooses her. And the third one is Elise Stefanik, who is a, uh, who is a little more, you, you have to sort of, she's not an obvious phony and a fraud and horrible person, but if you, if you sort of, Drill down a little bit, you discover she's a phony and a fraud and a horrible person. Mm. Uh, she seems to be completely unprincipled. She was on immigration. She was pro amnesty. Then she flipped, and she'll just do whatever is necessary. Uh, pretty embarrassing. So those are three horrible possibilities that make you think way less of Trump. <laughs> uh, that that's setting the bar pretty high for me. But um, I would think Carrie Lake on paper makes the most sense. She does. She's the most dynamic and she, you know, she'd be a good running mate, but she's, I, I don't know. It seems but to I mean, me if she, she, she was rejected by the voters in Arizona, what are the, what's the rest of America going to make of it? I mean, she was presumably more popular in Arizona than she well, would Trump be in was, another state. Trump was rejected by the voters of America and he's running for president. Um, but aren't we get, uh, getting ahead of the game here? I mean, you generally don't choose a vice presidential candidate until you're nominated, right? And he's a little ways away from that. Yeah, but he's he's not above. Uh, he he likes he's very impatient. He jumps the gun. It would be a good the, the gun. The yeah. gun has been jumped before, especially by candidates who are behind. Yeah. So if you uh, you know remember Reagan chose his vice president before the the yeah. convention where he lost to Ford, and it's been done before. It's a it's a trick that's used. So it's not that early, but you know it's I don't know. It just it just it, it, it it's revealing about Trump that these. People are sort of sucking up to him, and they actually have a hope of being vice president. Uh, yeah, but so, as you just pointed out, it's not a very illustrious trio. Uh, right. That's that's what it reveals about Trump. Oh, I see. Okay. He's surrounded by people who aren't illustrious. Uh, the uh, who'd have guessed? The, the other thing is, uh, uh, it seems to me the issue on DeSantis is people have started to focus on his. Uh, his social security stand specifically his willingness to cut social security at one point and so the big question about him is how how paul ryan is is he is is he really just a conventional paul ryan figure at heart uh and and that would be a, that would be death in the republican primaries so if he has a brain and we know he has a brain he's going to take steps to uh get rid of that image Mm -hmm. and, and and you know a, a good example of that is Jim Banks, who actually put a, is a congressman now running for senator for from Indiana, uh, and uh, against Mitch Daniels if Mitch Daniels chooses to run, and and he actually put out a position paper when he said of the Republican leadership group, you know, calling for all sorts of Ryan-y, bushy things in Social Security. I think he even had private accounts in there, but he definitely had cuts in Social Security. And he has now immediately renounced them. It's not renounced them, but said, you know, this it shouldn't be part of the debt negotiations. He's moving as far away from them as fast as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. So that's the smart thing that DeSantis should do. Uh, and but it's a question of will he do it or not. Do you uh, have a view on this new uh, chief of staff for Biden? Not Jeff, really. Jeff, is it Zaints? How does he pronounce Zients. it? Zients. Zion? Trust, Z, Z, trust, Z, the, Z, trust the Zion. Trust the Zion. Trust the Zion. That's good. He should run for office. With I've a already used sticker that. Sticker like that. I've already used that. Mm. Um, you you have nothing we, to say about him? Plus, we can't use the word the anymore. Haven't you read the AP New Style Handbook? 
uh, it rings a bell. What like the oh, like with uh, the, you can't the, say the handicapped. Well, you're not supposed to say handicapped anyway. But 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 like groups of people. You can't say you the can poor say, or yeah, the, the poor. The French. The French is the big one. They retracted that one today because the, the French were offended because <laughs> um, they uh, want to be called the French. Yeah, I mean, what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> but, but you're supposed to say French. French people rather than the French. It's just a bunch of complete idiots, idiotic bullshit. Uh, and uh, but um, the uh, I that's why I like that's why I like the you know Pache Peter Thiel. Uh, I like Gawker in its early incarnations because it completely uh, traduced this 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 uh, this. Uh, acceptable usage w with respect to groups and it would say uh, instead of not only did it not say poor not only did it say the poor it said the poors as if they were like just a that, sociological phenomenon that, interest group it was that, mocking it was right. mocking the conventional treatment it would say the gays you know well, that's the gays, different, though. The gays mean, are upset or the poors are upset or this will you know that's that that woman in White Lotus referred to them as the gays. I just want to stop uh, uh, and 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 rewind just a few seconds and point out that there are a lot of podcasts where people do not use the word pache, and you just used it. I just wanted to. Put I also used there. the word traduced, didn't I? Or is it hitting? Maybe, but there's something about pache. I mean, what is that? Latin? It means notwithstanding in Latin or something. Pretty fucking classic. Like a lot of thing. a lot of their podcasts where people just say anyway. notwithstanding, and it's like, what were you raised in a fucking barn, man? It's pache if you went to Harvard. So that, that well, was good. That, Peter Thiel put Gawker out of business. So it's not like notwithstanding Peter Thiel. It's like hold your fire, Peter Thiel. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, um uh and he had a beef, but but Gawker did have good writing, and I I, I love the mockery of the conventional. Speaking language. of speaking of phenomena, Peter Thiel is responsible for uh, your man JD Vance is is uh, he's feeling it on Ukraine, right? Is he, is he talking a bigger game now than you? I mean, I hadn't noticed him saying a lot, but I just saw this morning. He's like he's like you know what we could have spent this money for that we've been sending to Ukraine? He's always doing that, and he, he gets some sh grief for it because, like, he he had a... First, he had he had an interesting proposal. I mean, he's showing that he's hard to put in a box. He hired uh, a, a guy who works with Orrin Cass at American Compact, I think it's... I forget, I forget what the... American Compact Compass, magazine Compass, is, is... No, American Compass, I guess no. it is. Uh uh, who is who is not that conservative? Sort of like a you know a conservative who's trying to be a little liberal. He's for the child tax credit, but not for making it refundable, which was a good sign. And he said nice things about labor unions. So he's he's sort of it, it's hard to categorize him as hard right ultra MAGA. He's actually open to many ideas from the left. One of the ideas from the left that Vance had, which I thought was interesting, was making childbirth free. Childbirth, it's a big source of bank. Well, that's what he said. He's he said, if we took expensive. all the money we sent to Ukraine, right. we could make childbirth and, free. I wasn't sure what he meant. Wait, he and just meant pay to, all medical costs for, chi for yeah. childbirth? Yeah, like have it be like a, a government subsidized thing. If you, I guess if you can't afford it, the government will pay for it. He wants to encourage mm -hmm. childbearing. He, he's a big natalist. So anyway, but he had to press it with this Ukraine thing, which has become a tick. And it was pointed out that why say that? Why not just say, I want to make childbirth free? Why does it always have to be a Ukraine comparison? But yes, he has Ukraine on the brain. Uh, and uh, he, um, I think, is sort of in, 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 in more in your camp than in the Blob's camp. Not so much. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, he may, he we, may we even be talk about your, Ukraine. Your, Stuff is he, happening, may even but... be, he may even be to your right. Anyway, I, I, this is all a digression because you used the word V. What do you, what's the sense you use the word V in? I forget. I forget. Uh, it's hard I don't, to go a long time without using that word. I found, but I'll do my best if if it's. Uh, but what were you, what were you talking about? It's weird. I don't know. It wasn't the poor though. You're the one. You're the one who talks about the poor. Uh, God, I completely derailed. Of it was a good topic too. Oh well. Well, well, it, it'll. Um, uh, the the next generation will pick up that torch and carry it. Now, <laughs> now that we can't, we're incapable of remembering whatever we were talking um, about. Uh, so you want to talk about Ukraine? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's so a few things. Um, first of all, 
this corruption thing, uh, you know, a number of like regional uh, governors or something, plus some people in the actual administration, Zelensky fired for corruption. I, I, I guess to it's weird. They found them. It's just like penny any. Well, I don't know about the magnitude, but it wasn't about like, you know, taking the arms we're sending them and making money off them. Although that's in a sense the subtext because I, I think he wants to, there were rumblings about corruption. He wants to reassure the West, everything's under control. So he fires people for a bunch of corruption. And as it happens, it's not the kind of corruption he wouldn't want us to hear about, right? I mean, so these guys are, these guys for all I know were dealing weapons and shit, but they just mentioned that they were overcharging for food or something. Um, the, uh, there was also a guy in, in a related who was fired kind of almost the same day. I mean, first I have to say, these guys are masters of public relations. The same day that uh, this all this happened, they leaked a story that got a little play in the New York Times, not as much as they'd hoped, about a Ukrainian general who inherited a lot of money and donated all to the armed forces. I mean, I can't, I just got to believe it's not a coincidence that that story came out the same uh, day it didn't it didn't do as much to obscure the corruption stuff as you might like but it's obviously i thought the corruption stuff was they wanted to make it easier for us to give them arms because they're getting yeah, rid of it. all the corrupt people yeah so well yeah they want to reassure us that that so they want us to, they want us to see the corruption story too well do they no i i think they kind of want the admin they want elites to know that they want to create a talking point that elites can use whenever anyone says don't give money to the corrupt Ukrainians. I don't think they want this broadcast all over the news. And I think if they do want to broadcast, they're glad it's about food, not weapons. I, I guess I do. Yeah. Now, there was another guy who who uh, left the government. That was a different thing. It was almost the exact same time. Uh, what he did was, you remember the missile that uh, killed, I don't know, dozens of Ukrainians landed on, a, on an apartment building? Right. This was a guy who had been like a government spokesman. He used to be a, a secure, a, like a, a national security blogger type. He said, uh, you know, I think may what what may have happened is that our anti-aircraft missile hit this thing, knocked it off course, and it landed on the apartment building. And the next day he was not working for the government. You, huh. That's that's not the, but, that's not the talking but, point. When but the talk. big thing is that the. Uh, you know, by we're sending them three Abrams tanks or something, and that was the excuse Germany needed to to let them send a bunch of German tanks. Are you for this? Does this does this annoy you that, or do you have an objection to sending tanks to Ukraine? Let me uh, give you a let me let me back into my answer by first of all saying, like last week when I said, you know, uh, I wonder what the real reason we're not sending tanks is. We claim it's because. Uh, you know, maintaining the Abrams tanks is going to be harder than maintaining these German leopards and so on. What's the real reason? I didn't mean there was no validity to that. But what I was wondering was like, look, if if just by sending a few Abrams, we could give Germany, get Germany, give permission to all these European countries to send their leopard tanks. Why are we doing that? And I was puzzled by that. But anyway, we did that. And we're sending more. I think we're sending like 30 more. Oh. Uh, and this is going to free up, I don't know, 70, 80, 90 Leopard tanks or maybe more. Um, and uh, and then I suspect, I mean, the Abrams apparently are a total pain and, and the infrastructure is not there in Europe to maintain them and so on. But I think what's going to happen now is we'll start building the infrastructure we're taking care of the Abrams tanks, even though none are going to be in operation for probably at least six months. Uh, the Leopards will be in operation sooner. But here's the importance of the Abrams is, I think, if you look at the numbers of Leopards that European countries have, there's going to be like maybe one more round of like about 100 going to Ukraine. And then, I, I, I mean, you know, in a few months, they'll say we want some more. They'll give them some more. And uh, but after that, I think the stocks start running low in Europe, whereas the Abrams, we've apparently got like thirty five hundred of those in storage. So in principle, what wh wh we can now say, I mean, it, it now looks as if we can supply tanks at a moderate at a you know moderate pace. But for a long, long time is what I'm saying is that they're building these pipelines that would ensure that.
Meanwhile, we announced that we're uh, upping our production of artillery shells. We had already said we're going to, you know, we're only making 14,000 a month. They use like 90,000. Uh, we're going to get it up to 20 by February, March. Now they announced well, we're going to get it up to like 100 within, I don't know, a year and a half or two years or something. So that's on the way. And now I'm backing into the answer to the question, which is, okay, so with all the stuff, that's the weapons that are going to Ukraine and these supply lines and we're building the infrastructure for artillery shells, we can plausibly say to Russia, look, we can keep this going for a long time. It's, it's going to be a while before Ukraine runs out of people, even though, as I've said before, they're going to run out of people before Russia does, and that's a problem. But we can, we can now say to Russia, you know, how long do you want to play this game? We can probably, with this kind of support, we, they can probably keep you from some huge breakthrough. You're probably not going to get a whole lot more land. Um, why don't we start talking peace? Uh, and, and, unless you want to risk, uh, you know, your troops getting seriously rolled back. And by the same token, we have leverage with the Ukrainians to say, you know, we can we can cut this off if you don't want to talk peace the way we want you to talk peace. The point is, if if you were wanted to use this weapons flow to get Russia to the table and get this war ended uh, before you know, nuclear war breaks out and also before a lot more people die uh, and a lot and all kinds of other risks have a chance uh, to uh, realize their dark potential. Um, if you're going to use it that way, I'd say, great, you know, yeah, let's let's start sending tanks and then let's use them as leverage. But will this administration do this? I doubt it. I don't know. Uh, it are tanks, uh, it, it just seems to me, are tanks a stabilizing force or a destabilizing force? It seems to me, aren't they mainly useful as an offensive weapon and you can sort of pierce the enemy's lines and that could create a whole, a I whole mean, like I mean volatile people, mess there, right? The main official rationale is offense. We're going to use this to retake, you know, Eastern Ukraine. But most, most weapons can be used for defense or offense in one sense or another. And in this case, uh, the mere threat of these tanks uh, can tie down Russian troops, you know, yeah. or you can use them in a feint. And because of all of this armor, the Russians are going to have to commit a lot of resources to a particular place and then can't use them to, to launch an offensive in some other place. So right. it can work both ways, but people are talking about them as offensive yeah. uh, weapons. When are, are are they less destabilizing in the sense that I, I read some uh, from some sort of anti-interventionist war skeptic, you know, what happens when the first U.S. supplied missile hits the first Russian city? How does Russia react? And that does seem to be a huge risk. There seems to be less risk about providing tanks. I mean, they're not going to, yeah. like, destroy a Russian city. Although Russia's acting as if, you know, uh, the tanks are, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of the tanks is, is to uh, is to invade Russia. You can't tell how much of this is sin sincere. You know, Russia started putting like uh, anti-aircraft stuff on on top of uh, like the Ministry of Defense built apartment building in Moscow. And uh, it's not like I, I gather it's for drones because they have i think they have anti you know missile systems in place already and i can't tell the extent to which they think this is a real threat which it could be ukraine has used uh, drones this way uh or they're just trying to scare the people into thinking that this is a fight for uh national salvation um but uh i don't know what was your, did i didn't answer your question well, I, I i i the question is are tanks less threatening and and the the bigger question is oh, the missiles, but if yeah. one of our missiles struck a city would russia ignore it would that cause them to press the nuclear button would it cause the populace to to say this war is a bad idea or would it cause the population to think we have to fight this war let's go all out Oh, I think if if uh, American missiles hit a Russian city, that would uh, that would be good for Putin politically in terms of the amount of support uh, he has. I was talking to Nikita, our friend Nikita, on a podcast that's going to air Tuesday, and uh, he was saying the poll. He was saying just quit paying attention to public opinion polls. He's hearing that in some 
that the the, the the percentage of Russians who just refuse to respond is in some cases up to 97%. Um, <laughs> so uh, we don't know what kind of support he's got. I would think that would increase it. You know, the U.S. has been pretty restrictive uh, with, with even the relatively long-range missiles, the HIMARS we've given them. I think, you know, we've laid down the law about where they can and can't be used, certainly not on Russian turf. You know, Ukraine uh, is agitating for the longer range, uh, long range missiles, including the longer range version of those uh, high Mars or the ones that, that can uh, go from the same launchers. But we've been. Uh, I don't know, we'll see, but we're we're just loosening things up in general. And, uh, I, you know, people say, well, Putin says it's his red line, but apparently it's not. Yeah, I don't think any weapon system is the thing that's going to get him to to do something uh, super incendiary, possibly including nuclear weapons. I, I, I think it's about when he feels politically imperiled, when he feels like he can't, he has to advance on the battlefield or he will be imperiled politically or he can't suffer any more losses or he will be imperiled well, politically. And as I've said, we just don't know where that is. What, um, what about, isn't it obvious that now the Russians launched their offensive before all the tanks get there? Uh, uh, there have been, you know, stories saying that that's an incentive. I, I don't think the tanks will be operational big time until, uh, you know, there's there's the winter when the ground is frozen enough to launch offensives, although this is a pretty warm winter uh, and and that hasn't happened as fast as usual. I don't know what status is now. Then there's the wet season when it's too wet. Uh, and then like around mid-April, the ground is firm enough again. I think the soonest these tanks will be ready is then. And look, the Russians are being pretty active. Most of the offensive action, at least offensive attempts, as far as I can tell, um, are coming from the Russia side. There's there's a town called Vuladar in the south. It's very important logistically. If the Russians can control it, apparently, then they can start making use of this rail line in the south, which would really be a big logistical boost. They're fighting for that right now. That's a big one. Uh, and uh, you know they're making incremental progress north of there in the, in uh, uh, in the places I mean, we've talked about. If the ground's not frozen now, when is it going to freeze? It's I think it's half and half. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's like yeah. uh, it's freezing uh, like every day. The, it's above freezing for part of the time and below freezing for part of the time. So, I, I, so it, it's not rock solid ground, but probably you can you can you know it's probably pretty hard. I don't know. Um, well, up to the Abrams is sort of a light, you know, has a light touch on the land. I'm sure that <laughs> yeah. the Abrams will be able being to... sarcastic. Are these tons or metric tons? Because they're saying these things like 70 tons or something, right? It's like... I believe it. 70 real tons? Like 2,000 like, pounds? I, I'm joking. I don't, I, the answer is I don't know. It sounds... I mean, I assume metric tons heavier, are... Heavier than the, even the Ford electric pickup, which is 6,000 pounds. The, um... The, they also have that uranium armor, right? That's not light. No, they're super heavy. And apparently they're saying like the, the, the infrastructure issue is so much more complicated than people realize. And even with the Leopards, there's a lot of different variants of the Leopards. And in we... some cases, the parts are different. But like with the Abrams, the bridges, the standard issue bridges they would use to put across like a, a creek or river or something for a Leopard tank. And Abrams might fall through them. They're not, the, you know, they're they're not verified up to that up to Abrams level. So you might have to bring in a whole bunch of mobile bridges that are different from the mobile bridges. I don't know. And the advantage of the Abrams is once it's once it actually makes it to the front, it's actually pretty good. I mean, yeah, it's it's uh, well, I mean, it's it, 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 as you said, it ha I think it has good armor. It's. Almost as fast as the leopards, forty-five miles per hour versus fifty, I think, and uh, and and it's 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 got very heavy fire, and I guess it's technologically sophisticated. I think all of these tanks are technologically better than what the Russians have by at least a little. But but see, the thing is, I don't think there's you're seeing a lot of tank on tank battles. I I, I think because of the the drones partly. It's like uh, that's not what's happening. You know, that's not you don't kill tanks with other tanks. You kill them, you know. You kill them with, uh, with fire directed by drones. You, you kill the Abrams by firing a missile right at its hot exhaust, I believe. Yeah, that was or that, that was always that was that was always its weak spot. There was a whole literature of military reformers saying this is a stupid tank to build. 
it's way too heavy, way too fuel inefficient, and it has a weak spot of its exhaust. So, yeah, it's a, it's been a while now. Was it wasn't this uh, was this built was, by Chrysler? Was the M1 originally. Ago. I don't know, but um, uh, uh, it's the, now made by Fiat in Italy, right? Uh, oh, is it? <laughs> no, I'm joking. But a lot of Chryslers are made it by Fiat in Italy. Um, so that was my alarm, Mickey, which uh, okay. means well, we generally start. Yeah, I am going to go back and listen to the recording of this to see what topic I distracted you from, because I feel very guilty about that. Oh, come on. And you, you know I don't feel guilty about that. If you want things to be guilty about, feel guilty about, I've got a long list that I can give you I don't uh, want of, to go of recommended list. sources <laughs> of Mickey guilt. I don't want the list. I want my list. Um, we haven't even talked about Twitter, and I know our our listeners are are eager for us to talk about Twitter. Well, I was curious as to whether the uh, blue check mark you bought uh, has made a discernible difference in your. Uh... Well, you don't know. I don't know. I was going to ask uh, you. You're not going to tell me, or you're going to you're going to say no. I'm sorry. You have to pay. Getting... You have to you have to pay us uh, to get uh, the cover charge at the parrot room I'm, if you want. I'm getting more. I'm getting more Tinder dates because I put the blue check mark on Tinder and. It's like catnip. Yeah, that's what uh, they say, uh, Mickey. Uh, but um, anyway, um, we have uh, uh, a whole bunch of things to talk about. You want to say what yours are? Uh. Um, I uh, I had a quasi lucid dream. I want to talk about. Uh, have you ever uh, had a lucid dream? And what is a lucid dream? It's one where you, you're you're aware you're dreaming, and ideally you can then control the dream. Imagine the possibility. I've almost Mickey. had that. I've almost had that. Um, I want to. Uh, what else? Oh, I want to. I want. I got something wrong last week on the subject of evil. Actually, about the series Evil. I want to uh, fess up to that. Talk a little more about this uh, claim that the. Uh, the Maidan massacre was a false flag attack, uh, which was alleged by this uh, guy in my podcast. Mm -hmm. Wanted want to bring you up to date on that. Oh, you know, Russians with attitude uh, went on a little Twitter rampage that shed some kind of new light on uh, on the on on almost the political the energy that that drives these uh, the Nash, Russian nationalists who, who are so supportive of this war. This thing goes back further than I realized. Um, yeah. And that, ju that was just today. Uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, there's a Leon Weaseltier, uh, a quote from a Leon Weaseltier piece that somebody put on Twitter that's from decades ago that I thought I would um, read and, and possibly comment on. Is it uh, when you bleed us, are we not pricks? No. Uh, and I it's don't know. Yeah. Is not the gates of hell that await us. It's the hell of gates. That's his. Yes. It's not as good as the. I mean, it's <laughs> it's uh it's more subject to criticism than those. There. The uh, last thing I'll say is, you tell me if you don't want to hear this, you don't have to. But since the leopards are in the news, these tanks. By coincidence, I happened upon a poem I wrote in fifth grade called The Leopard, and it's your call. We'll get into the parrot room and see if you want me to read it. I definitely want that. Is it an erotic poem? <laughs> Mickey, I was 10 years old. Come on. Okay. Uh, you were precocious. Um, there's uh, the Sanders' War Against AP Black History with its segment on queer theory. Uh, we might talk about that. We have uh, sh uh, Should Judicial Candidates Know Which Articles? In the Constitution, affect which branches? There was a a Biden nominee who was embarrassed. Uh, there, uh, there's uh, uh, some Kirsten Cinema conspiracy, semi-conspiratorial theorizing. You know, she's stopping a Democrat, but uh, is that the end of her drift rightward? That's the interesting question. Um, there is uh, my friend John Ellis uh, wrote a, a couple of very good paragraphs about the difference between economic inequality and social inequality. Did he credit my book? We won't go into that. He, uh, he sure owes you as much. I mean, you mention his newsletter every week. 
You would think, wouldn't you? But anyway, he made an interesting point uh, that either advances the ball or doesn't advance the ball. And I want to ask you whether it does or doesn't. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's is there some exciting trial tax credit news? Mm. And I want to know why is Google going to collapse? I can't wait. I mean, they have this whole big building. They took over this giant shopping center right near where I live, uh, and they've redone it, and it looks like a college campus. I just can't wait until it like collapses. Well, they're under, you know, they're under uh, antitrust uh, threat. Uh, they they I, face I, they face a number of threats. One is, you know, we'll we'll is uh, yeah. we'll check. Well, we can talk about it. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it. Well, this, I've been keeping track of various tech stories. Maybe we'll talk tech. Well, uh, probably we should mention that uh, all hell may break loose in Israel uh, on, on on two levels. I mean, there was a, a you know thing in the West Bank uh, where where I think nine people were killed, and uh, and meanwhile Israel's domestic politics are kind of fraught. Well, they think there might be a civil war within the Israeli side, almost, right? Almost. I mean, it, it's uh, tense. Yeah, uh, we we can. Yeah, we can talk a little bit. Um, OK. Um, pretty exciting. OK, well. Well, the lucid dream wait. thing is uh, I, I find them fascinating. OK. And people sort of don't want us to talk about TV shows or some extremely vehement commenters don't want us to talk about TV shows. We don't some have do. any of those. We okay. don't have any of those. Well, the the TV show Evil, but I'm just going to straighten out one one thing about it. it um, it's it's not it's 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 okay. It's in the archives that show. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we Evil. will see Patri yeah. patriot.com slash parrot room is uh, where we will see. Wait, wait. For, first to evil. You know, I thought I saw signs of autonomy on the parrot. I'm not sure it said exactly what you said. This is getting <laughs> scary. There's a twilight zone about this, Mickey. Okay. Well, yeah. I thought first to evil was pretty witty of the parrot. It We're really talking about Google, right? Witty parrot. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It, hey. yeah. Okay. I get, I get I, no credit. The nickel just dropped. I I, I get the joke, and I'm. Uh, I I get no respect around here. I'm okay. R O T F. L and I'll uh we'll see people in the parable.